You know, there are times when you look at the world and you see what is happening, and it, it can be despairing. But, you know, it's been said that action is the antidote to despair. And sometimes that action is as simple as bringing vegan cupcakes to a non-vegan event. From the policy perspective, get involved. I mean, democracy is a participatory sport. If we don't show up, then our voice is not heard. We're swimming upstream against a mainstream machine, but I get hope from talking to people like you. I get hope from learning about the good things that are happening. I get hope from seeing animals come to a sanctuary and heal. I really do try to live in the good things. You know, that for me is helped keep me active and help keep me focused. What the hell is up, you guys? My name is Jamie Logan, and today I am here with Jean Bauer, best-selling... Of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the first time I've gotten that one. What the hell is up, you guys? My name is Jamie Logan, and today I am here with Jean Bauer, co-founder of Farm Sanctuary, best-selling author, undercover investigator, and just honestly a huge inspiration to me. So thank you for making the time here. Oh, thank you, Jamie. It's great to be here. Thank you for doing what you do. We're all in this together trying to raise awareness and create a kinder world. So I'm very grateful for your work. Thank you. And so you've been vegan since the 80s. Since 85, yes. This morning, I think you were saying 85. That's so crazy to think. I wasn't even born yet. It was just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that transition like for you? I just want to hear a little background of your vegan story. Well, I first learned about the cruelty to farm animals when I was in, in high school from my grandmother, actually, told me about how veal calves are raised. And I said, I'm never eating veal. Uh, and then in the early 80s, I actually hitchhiked around the country, got to know many activists, uh, learned about factory farming, and went vegan in 1985, co-founded Farm Sanctuary in 1986. Uh, but in 85, you know, there were a few hardcore vegans, and I was one of them. Um, and, you know, it was tough. You know, soy milk was not all over the place. I remember taking powder and mixing it with water for soy milk now, and you go to grocery stores and there's tons of not only soy milk, but almond milk, oat milk, all kinds of things. So it was harder uh, to get vegan food then, and also less of an understanding about what vegan living was. Mm -hmm. I think we've made a lot of progress raising awareness about what it is to be vegan. And in some cases that's challenging because mm -hmm. the vegan word isn't happy for everybody, right? Some of our non-vegan folk are not too sympathetic to vegan right. living. So, but there's more awareness about vegan living, which is good. And you're doing that in so many different ways, creating this awareness. And take me back to 86 when you co-founded Farm Sanctuary. There were no farm san animal sanctuaries. That's right. You founded that movement. And I guess why did you fi find it? And what is the importance of farm animal sanctuaries? So when Farm Sanctuary started in 1986, I felt it was very important to see firsthand what was happening. I didn't want to read a book or have somebody tell me something. I wanted to see firsthand. So we started doing investigations mm -hmm. at stockyards, factory farms, slaughterhouses, and we would find living animals left in trash cans or literally dumped on piles of dead animals. So we started rescuing them. And at the time, we, we were living in a little row house in Wilmington, Delaware, that a fellow activist let us use. And we rehabilitated the animals in the backyard, found homes for them. So our adopt a farm animal program started very early. Mm -hmm. And we recognized, too, that people in the neighborhood were very curious about the turkeys that were in the backyard or the lamb and, and started asking questions. And it was clear that these animals were ambassadors and people cared about them. And telling those stories helped people to understand farm animals as something other than a commodity. Uh, but the way we funded the organization in the early days, do you know how that was? I have no idea. The way we funded Farm Sanctuary back in the early days was by selling vegan hot dogs out of our Volkswagen van at Grateful Dead shows. That's amazing. <laughs> epic. Epic. So we didn't at the time have, you know, we were an all-volunteer organization, and we started by investigating, but then also raising awareness. When we sold the vegan hot dogs, we would also do outreach and education, showing before and after pictures of animals from the stockyard where we found them to now living a good life, a downed animal on a dead pile, now standing and enjoying themselves. So that was early part of our work. Uh, we still do animal rescue. We'll continue to do animal rescue always. Mm -hmm. And in addition, we need to continue educating and doing more there and changing systems and structures. 
you know, I think we live in a current ecosystem of beliefs. And one of the big beliefs is that animals are here for us to use, which is we totally disagree with. And that's one of those mainstream assumptions people have were challenging. But in addition to changing people's thinking and belief systems, uh, we also need to change the machinery, uh, uh, the infrastructure that mass produces animal products. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we need to deal with both beliefs and sort of the software in a sense, and then the hardware you know, and the infrastructure and the machinery. So it's both and that we do. Uh, but the animal rescue is largely, you know, touching hearts and, and connecting, having the lived experience, the empathy with the individuals and watching them heal, which helped us heal. Because mm -hmm. going into these places was hard. And, and being able to see animals, seeing that over and over was, was very hard. Seeing animals come to the sanctuary and recover helped us also heal. And that's the, the key of, of sanctuary work still, right? It's that healing, it's that transformation mm -hmm. that occurs when, when cruelty is, is replaced with kindness. Mm, that's really beautiful. And I, I think you bring up a really good point about the individual. Because when you look at the scale and the scope of animal agriculture and these issues, it's almost hard to process how many lives are taken that when you zoom in on the individual animal with their own personalities, with their own thoughts and feelings, it becomes that much more intense and, and sad because yeah. you're like, we're literally taking the entire existence away from individuals. Yes. So can you recall a specific rescue story that uh, just truly touched your heart, connected you to this issue? Maybe it was your first one that made you think that you would never stop doing this. Our first rescue was Hilda, mm -hmm. who was a sheep that we found left on a pile of dead animals behind Lancaster Stockyards in Pennsylvania. And we come across this, we used to do a lot of investigations and often would find animals suffering inside the stockyard. And behind the stockyard was the dead pile because animals died in the process. And so we would go by the dead pile and take pictures. And one day we were there and there were dead cows, dead pigs, dead sheep. And as we were taking a picture, this lamb lifted her head off the dead pile. And wow. we thought, how could a living animal be thrown here like trash, literally? So we assumed she was in really bad shape and would have to be euthanized. So we brought her to a veterinarian, thinking she'd have to be euthanized, but she stood up within about half an hour. Mm. She lived with us for more than 10 years, and that was Hilda, mm. our first rescued animal. And then we started educating people in Pennsylvania around Lancaster stockyards about the mistreatment of downed animals, animals too sick to walk. So Hilda was down, couldn't walk off the truck, and was just dumped on the pile behind the stockyard. Um, and so we started raising awareness, campaigning for a no downers policy where the stockyard would no longer accept and sell downed animals. Uh, and then we eventually were able to get them convicted of cruelty after about seven years of campaigning. And we tried to do this with Hilda. When we found her on the dead pile, nobody, local law enforcement wouldn't do anything about it. This was considered to be normal agricultural practices. So by raising awareness and educating the community, and then we actually incorporated as a law enforcement agency in Pennsylvania. We were a farm sanctuary of Pennsylvania. We were an SPCA, which allowed us to empower a law enforcement agent. And that's how we were able to prosecute the stockyards. So we raised awareness, but then we created the machinery, the actual enforcement mechanism, and we, they were convicted of cruelty after seven years. Wow. So that's yeah. just like a perfect example of the impact. Yes. And of the rescue and the education and the advocacy going together. And another story I like to tell is of this calf who I found uh, in an alleyway at a stockyard in upstate New York. Um, and New York State is a big dairy state. And because of that, you have a lot of calves being born. For a cow to produce milk, she has to have a baby. Half of those babies are male. They are useless on the dairy farm. That's how the veal industry was actually created to use all these unwanted male calves. Um, but so male calves from dairy farms often go into the veal industry. They go into the beef industry. They're worth very, very little economically. And they sometimes go to the stockyard when they're frail and in bad shape. So one day I'm at the stockyard in upstate New York and I come across this calf who's crumpled in a heap in an alleyway. His eyes were sunken in, he was practically comatose. He was left to die. And I went to the stockyard worker and I said, what's going on with this calf? And he said, I've got to bury him later today, kind of irritatedly and, and you know, without recognizing this, this is an individual here suffering. And I said, well, what if I take him off your hands? 
I said, sure, go ahead. So I brought this calf to a nearby veterinarian who is friendly to the dairy industry. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, what are you wasting your time for? Makes no economic sense. And I said, this is not about economics. This is about this individual. I want to do what I can to help. She finally gave him intravenous fluids. I brought him back to the sanctuary, watched over him. Slowly, the light started coming into his eyes, started to be able to lift his head, started to be able to suckle from a bottle. Mm -hmm. And I thought, he's going to make it. But he wasn't thriving, and he was not a happy calf. And I was thinking, what's wrong? And I realized he had to be with his people. He had to be with the other cows. So I brought him out to the cow barn. I put him in a pen. The other cows gathered around, mooed to him. He <laughs> mooed back, and this spark came, right? So it really spoke to and speaks to how these individuals are social animals, yeah. like human beings. And if we're in a, we have physical needs, we also have emotional needs. Yeah. And that's the story of Opie. And he lived with us for nearly 20 years. He ended up weighing close to 3,000 pounds. And I loved going out into the barn and just being there with him. He's like this powerful, graceful, beautiful presence. And he's no longer with us, but, uh, but I, I often think of Opie and just uh, how beautiful that whole transformation was mm -hmm. and how he needed more than just his physical needs. He mm -hmm. had emotional needs as well. And also how that story alone can help people connect to veganism and leave animals off their plates. I think that that's really, in, in my opinion, the power of animal sanctuaries, how you have all of these individuals with stories that come from such horrific places, these these precious little innocent baby animals, really, yes. and then how they grow and they come into their own personalities and they're goofy. Some of them are more serious. <laughs> some of them are, are shy. Some of them are not. And it's just, it, that, that is super powerful when you can have a non-vegan person come to an animal sanctuary, visit, and connect with those stories and, and with those individuals. Completely true. And they all have their own personalities. Yeah. They're individuals. And getting to know and see them that way has a big impact. Totally. And recognizing they're not that different than cats and dogs. We have sheep that love to be petted, mm -hmm. and so you're petting them, you stop petting them, and they claw at you, right? They want to keep getting petted. Mm -hmm. We have turkeys that are oftentimes very outgoing and friendly, <laughs> and we've had people sitting in the pasture, and the turkeys come and sit on their lap. And that really does something. You know, so on the sanctuary, you have this visceral interaction, this connection um, that is more than just our thinking, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's embodied, and there's different ways of knowing. You know, and, and intellectual knowing is one thing, and it's rational, and that's mm -hmm. fine. Then there's sort of our visceral feelings, right? Our, our heart, our gut, our soul, right? And there's mm -hmm. these other ways of knowing. And sanctuaries, I think, help to enliven that part of humanity to connect with non-human animals and to recognize how we all share this planet. Mm -hmm. We share the same air. We share this earth. And the energy we put into this world affects everybody yeah. right and so when there's slaughterhouses and violence of factory farms and going into these places you sense the stress and sense the fear and mm -hmm. sense the the violence and and you know and, and animals smell the blood and so it's like this really horrible place and you go from there to a sanctuary and it's just a whole different world mm -hmm. you know and and that's the kind of peace that we want to embody and to model and to encourage beyond the sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy, right? We can't rescue the billions of animals, but we can create models and, and see these individuals as living creatures who deserve kindness. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that kindness to others is so good for us, right? Yes. It feels great to see somebody heal, right? I mean, going to a slaughterhouse is a very different experience than going to a sanctuary. You know, mm -hmm. and the, the slaughterhouse, if it opens you, it, it hurts you. Yeah. So it closes you generally. Going to a sanctuary opens you mm. and it heals, yeah. you know, and it's a connecting and an empathizing thing. Mm. And speaking of kindness, I mean, you've created this model, but you yourself as a person also re emulate this. And I don't even know you all that well, but I can just sense your energy and all the things that you say and that you do, you know, your actions, you are so kind. And my next question really is, after seeing all of the suffering in the world and after seeing so many of the inhumane laws, dealing with people that 
are angry and that don't always exude that same kindness. And being an activist, it can be frustrating living in a non-vegan world. How do you maintain your peace and how do you use kindness to advocate and why is that effective? I think that uh, it's important to recognize what we can do and what we can't do. Mm. And I think sometimes, you know, we want things to change right now and they are not going to change right now. So it's that serenity prayer, right? Mm -hmm. To give me the strength to change the things I can, mm. the serenity to accept the things I can't change, and the wisdom to, to know, know the, the difference. difference. Yes. yes. So I really try to lean into the what I can do, and I try not to fret or run around in my head too much about the things I can't do, because that will take you to bad places, and I have seen it. Um, and I have been into stockyards, I have been into slaughterhouses where people have come after me with, you know, in, in very violent ways. And I feel that in many cases those people are stuck in this machine and they're trying to hold on to a certain way of being that I'm challenging. And it's scary and they're fearful of change and they feel judged. And for me, a, a large part of this work over the years has been really trying to understand and to empathize, including with those who I have very different opinions from. Mm. And, and understanding that sometimes people are stuck in these systems and doing horrible things. People who work, who work at slaughterhouses oftentimes don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel bad for them. I feel bad for the animals, but I also feel bad for the people who are stuck there and feel they have no other option. Yeah. And so we've really, in recent years, started to try to figure out pathways for people to get out of the factory farming industry, for workers to be able to find new types of jobs, uh, for people who have farmland to have opportunities to go into plant-based agriculture. So this is something that's evolving right now. But it's not, it's, it's love the sin or hate the sin. That to me is really important. And good people do bad things. And most times people would rather not do bad things. And so somebody's doing a bad thing, right? They're working in a slaughterhouse causing horrible harm. Then the vegan comes by and says, you're doing a horrible thing. They hit the roof, you know, because they kind of know they're doing their bad thing. And we tell them that and we tell them to stop and they don't know what they can do. Mm. So it's figuring out, how do we help folks in these rough places to have different options, mm, you yeah. know? Kind of being persuasive in a way that like, we gotta be smart. If you're going up to a slaughterhouse worker, you wanna, I feel, try to find some sort of common ground, mm -hmm. you know, and try to relate to them on a level. And this goes beyond advocacy. I think this is just generally in relationships. I don't always love the term meeting people where they're at because I will never agree with animal abuse in any form, but trying to find whatever that common ground is and then going from there. We, we want to live <laughs> on a healthy planet. We yes. want to breathe clean air. We yes. want clean water. Right. We don't want unnecessarily unnecessary violence and killing happening every day around us, whether it's of human or non-human animals. Right. You know, I think there's an awful lot that we can speak about that will appeal to the vast majority of people mm -hmm. to eat food that makes us healthy instead of food that makes us sick, mm -hmm. to support a food system that is not destroying the planet, mm -hmm. causing the climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, um, to support a food system that instead of causing harm is actually causing health and well-being. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, these are some basic concepts. And of course, yeah. they have to be teased out and gotten into detail over. Um, and, but I think those broad concepts are, there's a lot of area for common ground. And if somebody really cares about the climate, that's an area to talk about. Totally. Somebody really cares about their health, there you go. They care about animals, there's, a, there's social justice. There's people who live in communities near factory farms where you literally have animal waste being spewed into the air, getting on people's houses. And there's so many things about this industry that are, 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 are horrendous and upsetting. And, and, and there's a lot of common ground there. 
Right. How about we're on your side? We are on your team. We want to help you. And regardless, like if you go vegan and go on a plant-based diet and you're eating a well-balanced diet, that's going to make you live longer. You're going to feel better. And you're going to be, I think, aligning your morals with your actions. Nobody goes around saying, oh, I want to hurt animals unless there's something seriously wrong with you. So that being said, it's just a matter of aligning the compassion and kindness that you have in your heart with all living beings. There's a consistency and an integrity there Mm. as opposed to a dissonance yeah right you're living in alignment with your values Mm -hmm. and your interests yeah ultimately i think people see veganism as a sacrifice they think that when you go vegan you have to give up all your favorite foods or you can't hang out with your friends and you're some hippie that lives in the forest i mean (laughs) how would you respond to that i I love the idea of a hippie living in the forest okay maybe one of these days i'll get to do that Uh, Uh, But I think that it's true. There are certain notions people have about vegans, you know, Uh, but vegans are really quite diverse. You know, a friend of mine who's a speechwriter for George W. Bush in the White House is a vegan. He wrote a book called Dominion, The Power of Man, The Suffering of Animals, The Call to Mercy. His name's Matthew Scully. So he's a vegan, you know, person who's not a liberal. And you have you know, vegan hippies as well. And I like them all. I do too. <laughs> and, I, and I like, you know, everybody who wants to make the world kinder, right? Yeah. We're, we're all in this together. Yeah. And too often there are these strange divisions that occur. And it's really about finding commonality, cohesion, shared experience. And the thing about sanctuaries is it's a lived experience. You visit, you connect with other animals and with other people, and you're in this space where vegan is normal. Mm. You're in a space where the animals are our friends, not our food. And it's a space where unnecessarily, unnecessary violence is not part of the equation. Mm-hmm. And in so much of our world, there is violence mm-hmm. and it is normalized and then it is rationalized, whether it's to other humans or to other animals. It's like, well, we've got to do this. We've always done this. Well, just because we've always done something, that's one of the worst reasons to keep doing it, you know, <laughs> yeah. especially when it's so harmful, yeah. you know. So it's really like, it's very rational to be vegan. It also feels good to be vegan. Mm-hmm. So I think um, when we look, but, you know, it's been said that, you know, human beings, were the rational animal. I think it's a lot more accurate to say that we're the rationalizing animal. Mm-hmm. And we come up with good reasons to do bad things over and over again. Right. Uh, But if you look at things holistically and you look at empirical reality, you look at science, you look at costs uh, and benefits of like to the environment, to our health, to everything, it's pretty obvious that a vegan world is much better for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that is, again, the message I think that, you know, we're we're not here to take things away from people. We're not here to make people's lives less interesting and less enjoyable. The opposite. Yeah. You know? I like to just say we need to just stop taking what was not ours to take in the first place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's this entitlement that human beings can have. We're entitled to that. Why are we entitled? You know, And this entitlement thing doesn't only go between humans and non-humans. It goes between humans too, right? Some mm-hmm. folks feel they're entitled to certain things mm-hmm. uh, and do not, you know, power is a very corrupting part of humanity and those with power tend to lose their empathy. Mm. And that is sort of an across the board thing, I'm afraid. And the more we mistreat somebody else, uh, the more we are likely to denigrate the victim of our abuse. And in the case Mm. of farm animals, they're among the most abused creatures on the planet. And not only do we abuse them in their bodies, we also kind of abuse them in who they are. And You know, being called a pig is not a compliment, right? And it's a way to put down a person, but also inherently putting down a pig. Being called a turkey is not a compliment. How about being called a filthy animal? Exactly. They're not filthy. Mm -mm. You know, there's this, I've seen these different quotes about like, uh, you know, be more like an animal. Animals don't destroy the planet the way humans do. Be more like other animals. Mm -hmm. I think there's wisdom in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people also will use the lion and tiger argument to be like, well, they rip zebras apart and they chase their nature is cruel, which they don't realize also that the nature also has a very small percentage of carnivores. Most Mm -hmm. of nature, I think it's upwards of 70% are herbivores. 
And that being said, like we shouldn't model our actions and our behaviors off of lions and tigers. We are not lions and tigers. We are not carnivores. No. If you look at us biologically, <laughs> our bodies are very different than those yes. of lions and tigers. We have a very long intestinal tract. Lions and tigers and other carnivores have a very short intestinal tract because yeah. meat is a putrefying flesh yeah. and it's got to get through you soon. Yeah. So this is something that creates and contributes to colon cancer in human beings. Mm -hmm. We also do not have claws to tear flesh. Mm -hmm. um, now, human beings have developed various technologies that allow us to do many things. Human beings are very uh, in influential on the planet. We have a lot of power. Uh, but with that, I think, comes responsibility. Yes. And if we can live well, why wouldn't we? And if we can show kindness to others and improve the world at writ large, why wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. And our animal agriculture system uses enormous amounts of land, water, and other resources. We're destroying habitats. We're destroying ecosystems. And as a result, we're losing species. Mm -hmm. we're, some scientists say the sixth major extinction here, again, uh, they talk about us being in the Anthropocene era, you know, a time on the planet that will be measured, you know, in geological measurements like millions and millions of years, where you look at the sedimentary layer, the, the fossils of this time, and this could be plastic and chicken bones <laughs> as some of the primary parts of, really? the, of what we're leaving on the planet during this time. Um, so, and if you look at species on Earth, there was a survey done a few years back looking at the mammals on Earth. They found that 96% are humans or domesticated, mainly farm animals. 4% right. live in the wild because we're destroying natural ecosystems. In the case of birds, 70% are domesticated, mainly chickens. Only 30% live in the wild. So we, you know, there's that old bumper sticker. Humans aren't the only species on Earth. We only act like it. Mm. And it's true. We are acting entitled yeah. to destroying rainforests and destroying others' homes, mainly to raise animals for food or to raise crops to feed to animals raised for food. It's horribly inefficient. Horribly inefficient. Mm -hmm. But we have agricultural programs and incentives, billions of dollars spent every year uh, from the federal government, state governments, local governments to incentivize an unhealthy animal-based food system, which is bad for animals, bad for people, bad for the planet. I was just going to ask you, how is it that this keeps happening? How is it that we have the system in place? And you kind of answered that through the government subsidies. That's how we're able to keep meat and dairy and egg prices artificially low. But that kind of leads us to the next part of this, which is legislation. What do we need to do as activists, in your opinion, to start to really make impact and create change for the animals? I think it's important to show up wherever you can. Show up in your community. You know, mm -hmm. if you're part of a church or other social group, be there, be present, and reflect vegan living and, and lead by example. Uh, bring good vegan food so people can see that. From the policy perspective, uh, get involved. I mean, democracy is a participatory sport. If we don't show up, then our voice is not heard and the animal's voice is not heard. Agribusiness has been very good at showing up for decades. They're very entrenched in Washington, D.C. They're entrenched in state capitals. They're entrenched in local governments. Mm -hmm. So we need to start showing up. And each person has different capacity to have influence. Uh, some people, for example, might know elected officials. Get you know, Or if you don't, get to know them yeah. and start expressing some of these concerns. In Washington, D.C., uh, because agribusiness is so entrenched, it's going to take some time. But we need to start investing our time uh, in the process and uh, identifying opportunities mm -hmm. to start shifting resources away from factory farming towards plant-based agriculture. You know, instead of subsidizing CAFOs and subsidizing the cleanup of factory farm waste, we should start investing in local community-oriented plant-based agriculture, family farms. Everybody talks about the benefits of family farms, even the factory farm people. They actually have appropriated the the term factory farm and the identity of family farmers hmm. to sell factory farms. Right. So, so factory farms don't only, in the case of contract growers in the poultry industry, for example, they appropriate the land. They sort of take control of that, even though they don't technically own it, they control what happens there. They appropriate the labor 
of the farm worker, and they are now also appropriating the identity of the family farmer uh, to sell policies in Washington, D.C. that benefit the factory farming industry at the expense of the family farmer. So that happens with the dairy industry. We hear about dairy farms who are struggling, and dairy farms are struggling. So the big dairy industry lobby goes to Washington, D.C., says these small dairy farms are really struggling. Give the dairy industry money. Most of that money goes to the big factory dairy farms who are closing down the small dairy farms. So it's this in, insane extractive approach yeah. where they're taking land, they're taking labor, they're taking identity and exploiting it to benefit themselves. Usually the people that don't care about animals don't care about people either. I would just like to say that, and that's a perfect example, is like, I wanna make it super clear that like vegans are not against farmers, we are against animal cruelty. So it's like, take farmers, help them transition to farming plants and evolve with the times. Yes. You know, that's really what it's all about. I mean, it's like, how much money is, is enough money for these people? They have billions of dollars. Let it's it insane. give it up. It's insane. It's insane. No, like you say, vegans are not against farmers. No. We're against cruelty. Yes. We are for kindness. Yes. I think most people would agree with that. Yes. So I saw that you did the Tucker Carlson <laughs> interview a few five years ago at this point. 2018, yeah. Okay. Close, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about like the power of mainstream media and also like tell me a little bit about that interview and how they, they literally come at your throat <laughs> and you have to like, de you have to just calm them down for a sec. And it's like veganism is so logical. Just give us a chance to speak. That's right. And, and, and please listen too. Yes. <laughs> you know, when I was on with Tucker Carlson, you know, he sort of came out gunning and wanting conflict in battle. And I just, you know, he said, you want everybody, you're, you're telling everybody not to eat meat. And I said, I can't tell people what they can't or can't eat. I just want people to think about their food choices and to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. And he basically agreed. And we had a, a, a long back and forth. And at the end, he said, I've got to admit, I thought this vegan guy's going to be crazy, but he made, you made some really good points. Mm -hmm. and, and then afterwards that evening, he went home and he had a salad. I heard later on. Wow. So it really had a positive impact on Tucker Carlson, who I don't generally agree with on most things. But we did agree that cruelty to animals was not okay mm -hmm. and that we as human beings have an obligation to treat other animals with kindness. Yeah. You know, he was, at one point, he was trying to talk about, um, are we equals with other animals? And if we're, and, and, and what kind of rights do animals deserve versus what kind of rights do humans deserve? And I didn't really talk about rights versus not rights, but I talked about power. I said, we have the power over other animals. We can do things to other animals, but that doesn't make it right. Yes. right? It's, it, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. And I think sometimes that's sort of a trap we get stuck in as humans. We can do this. We've always done this, so we should keep doing this. I think we need to be more self-reflective. Mm -hmm. We need to be more humble. We need to also be more rational yeah. and just think about the consequences of our actions and the harm that we are causing, the unnecessary harm that we are causing to other animals, to nature, and to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So as vegans, you know, I, I think being vegan is really an aspiration to live as kindly as possible. Mm -hmm. There's no sort of black and white, you're a vegan or you're not a vegan. Although sometimes it's said that way, you know, it's yeah. kind of more of an identity thing. But being vegan to me is really an aspiration. It is something, it is a practice. It is an effort to live kindly. Mm -hmm. And that can be challenging in a world where, you know, you're bombarded with factory farming advertisements and fast food restaurants and things like this. So we're streaming, swimming upstream against a mainstream machine that causes enormous harm. And it's easy just to mm -hmm. flow with the machine and be part of the problem. And many of us were when we were younger. When I was a kid, I grew up in Hollywood. I actually did commercials for McDonald's. Oh my God. <laughs> I did commercials for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Wow. I was a kid. I was like a, an extra. So I wasn't right. like a speaking person on TV, right. but I was like in the background and uh, didn't think about it. You know, yeah. you grow up in an environment where certain things are the norm. And unless you have 
access or exposure to a different way of being, you don't know there's a different way of being. Uh, and I think that's important for us to remember as vegans that oftentimes folks don't have exposure to what it is like to live a vegan lifestyle. And unfortunately, I think in many cases, there's been an, uh, an active effort to denigrate vegans and to mm -hmm. label vegans and to say that vegans are unreasonable or whatever. I mean, I could definitely say I've been a little harsh and unreasonable in the past. I am a little militant. But and it's okay to be that way. Yeah. It takes all kinds. Right. Yeah. And I think that there's different approaches, obviously, that work for different people. But I think as activists, it's super important that we constantly take a step back and look at the bigger picture and say, am I being effective? Is my approach effective? Am I changing people? What kind of feedback am I getting back from others? And when I first went vegan, I mean, you could probably relate. It's like you look at the world completely differently. You're like, holy crap, I've been lied to my whole life. And I was angry. Yes. You look at what's happening in animals. I mean, you're talking about going to these stockyards where you're seeing like dead animals and then live animals piled on top of them. I mean, it's horrific suffering. It's like the worst thing, the scale and the scope of it. It's the worst thing that's happening on our planet right now in terms of scale. Yeah. Um, so it's hard not to get angry. So I think though, as you were saying, I love how you were talking about like your, your approach and your interview with Tucker Carlson, because it's like, we constantly as activists, I think that we have the responsibility to learn how to speak with others, to, to, um, reform our rhetoric and to make sure that our messaging is on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I want to open it up for like for you to give some tips to some of the people that follow this, because I do have a lot of activists that listen to this, mm -hmm. and you've been doing this for so long, for so many years. Mm -hmm. So could you offer some tips and tricks that have helped you be more effective? You know, I think what you're saying about paying attention, noticing the impact of our words and our actions, and is it the impact we actually want to achieve or not? Right. Like holding up certain factory farming pictures, for example might turn people off. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a time when we want to show people what is happening. Mm -hmm. I think we need to show people what is happening. But if we're constantly just showing the bad stuff over and over again, uh, and people don't feel that there's an escape or there's an, a, a solution, they're gonna just stop looking, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. And then they're gonna just run away when they, these issues come. So with groups like Farm Sanctuary, one of the, I think our major benefits is we can show the bad images and then there's a hopeful story at the end. Yeah. Somebody who's able to escape that and enjoy their life. And I think that with activists, we need to educate people about the problems. And as you say, this can make people very angry. It made many of us very angry. And so we bring that energy. Can't you see what's happening? How can you support this, right? When we first started, our initial thinking was, we'll get videotapes, we'll get pictures, we'll show people what's happening, they'll all go vegan. Right? That's what we thought. Yeah. It's more complicated than that. Yeah. But those images are important. Many people, when they see those images and learn about the cruelty, um, change. I changed from that. Yeah. So that's very effective. So we can't dismiss that. Right. Anger is a natural emotion. And we can't dismiss that either. But how do we now take that anger? How do we take that energy and channel it into something productive? Right. Uh, and, and so this is where just constantly being mindful of the way our behaviors and our actions are affecting others. We, you know, our audience is not us. Yeah. Our audience is folks that are not vegans. Mm -hmm. Our audience are folks who we need to empathize with and understand uh, and, and try to speak to them in, in ways that are relevant to them. Mm -hmm. So if somebody cares about the climate, that's a very good topic to discuss uh, because you can find common ground there around animal agriculture being a huge problem when it comes to the climate issue. Uh, if somebody has health issues, uh, talking about how dairy, for example, contributes to lactose intolerance or, 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 or to acne or to whatever it might be. Yeah. You know, talk about something that is relevant and will be helpful to the other person. You know, our goal is not to put anybody down. Our goal is ultimately to help humans act more kindly and to do it in a way that is beneficial for them and also beneficial for other animals and the environment. That is the goal, right? It's a win, 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 win across the board. Yeah. So I think just keeping that in mind and when there is an anger, uh, try not to let it go into judgment. 
right. uh, because when it becomes, and, and we all have our opinions, right? So in a sense, humans do judge, but just being mindful of this and, and, and try not to judge the person as much as judging the action, mm. you know, because uh, good people or people who have potential to be vegan and potential to act kindly oftentimes do things that are not kind. Mm. And many of us back when we were, you know, earlier before we had heard differently, had done things that we wouldn't do today. Right. And that's the beauty of it. We can learn as we go. And I think just um, recognizing that different people come to this in different ways, mm -hmm. um, but you can't control others, but you can't control yourself. Mm. And so that is somewhere to focus. Yeah. And to do the best you can and learn from mistakes because we will all make mistakes and that's just part of being human. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the advice. I think that that all is so important. And I am so curious. I always ask people this because I think um, as activists, we have to have some sort of optimism, right? So <laughs> what is your, your predictions of the future of the vegan movement? <laughs> you know, it's very hard to predict the future. Um, and I really try to live in the present. Okay. But I get hope from talking to people like you and other folks here at the conference. I get hope from learning about the good things that are happening. I get hope from seeing animals come to a sanctuary and heal. Um, I, 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 I really do try to live in the good things. You know, that for me is helped keep me active yep. and help keep me focused. You know, there are times when you look at the world and you see what is happening and it, it can be despairing. Uh, but, you know, it's been said that action is the antidote to despair. Mm. So I think when I start feeling despairing, I try to take action. Yeah. And sometimes that action is, you know, as simple as bringing vegan cupcakes to an event or something yeah. like that, to a non-vegan event. Uh, it's also important for activists to take care of themselves, yes. you know, because just running on the treadmill and taking action over and over can be a distraction uh, from taking care of ourselves. And that's things as simple as getting enough sleep, mm -hmm. staying hydrated, eating good food, yeah. uh, and surrounding yourselves with a community that is healthy and emotionally supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't always mean, yes, I agree with you. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah. That can mean, hey, wait a second. Did you you know, when you did this, it caused these situations, right? So it's being authentic and honest and being able to have conversations like that in a compassionate way. Mm. Uh, and But it's taking care of yourself, right? And yeah. really being yourself and being able to express yourself, even when what you're saying may not be considered popular at a particular time. Absolutely. And when we don't take care of ourselves, it makes it that much harder to fight for others. Absolutely. <laughs> I, yeah. And I, I also love that you were saying, you know, just being raw, authentic, honest. I think in the vegan movement, there's so many fueled emotions because we're obviously dealing with such a pressing issue that sometimes we let it out on each other and the infighting can yes. really be damaging to the movement. Like we really have to work together. And as you were saying, sometimes we don't always have to agree on everything. It's good if we don't agree on everything yeah, in there's some ways, right? Different there, approaches. There's different approaches. And this is such a huge issue. There are some fundamental things it's easy to agree on, not only among vegans, but among a much bigger audience, yeah. right? And I think that we should focus on those, dig into those. And if there are differences of opinion, that's okay. Yeah. We just need to learn to disagree well and to actually you know, recognize that none of us has all the answers. Absolutely. We're all learning as we go. If we see somebody doing something that we think is harmful, I think it's okay to talk to that person and yes. say, I think when you did this, it was not helpful in this way. And then that's yeah. a direct conversation. And they might actually say, well, the reason I did it was because X, Y, and Z. And I may not have even thought of that, right? Mm -hmm. So I might learn something. And so to open it up to have conversations that are not easy conversations, um, you know, we can all agree, I mean, in the vegan world that vegan living makes sense. But again, there are different, there's some, you know, whole food plant-based vegans. You know, I, I've been in the animal rights side of this, the ethical vegan side of this for a long time. And I went to a, an event that was hosted by folks that are more health oriented. Mm -hmm. And I had just come from the plant-based world expo in New York City. Okay. And I brought these vegan muffins from the expo. 
but they were, you know, they had sugar in them and they had, you know, refined flour and things like this. And I walked in with these muffins and these were whole food plant-based folks, some of them who had lost like 100 pounds and, you know, and yeah. health was a significant issue. And that, those muffins were, were not a good idea. They're like, out the door you go. <laughs> right? So, so, okay, it's a whole, so these are vegans, yeah. but this is a whole different thing. Right. Yeah. So there's different vegans, different parts of the vegan movement, different parts of our community uh, that we can work with in different ways. Mm-hmm. You know, so I now know that certain folks, you know, are very careful about what they eat. You know, sure. and also and there's like the no oil folks, sure. right? You know, so, and, and that's fine. Sure. And, you know, so each of us has to do what we feel is right. Yeah. I think it's important to respect others. Uh, and if there's a concern, to just be very honest and direct about it instead of uh, otherwise. I think that's really great advice. And, and unfortunately, we do live in an age where it's cancel culture and everybody wants to post about each other online instead of having those direct conversations. And what's unfortunate is it's like, well, if you don't go to the person directly, they don't even have the chance to chat and respond. And it makes us as a movement look unorganized. Completely. <laughs> and, 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 and toxic even. Yeah. Honestly, which is very unfortunate because so much communication happens more than just through digital media. Yeah. And it's so simplistic and somewhat Mm -hmm. superficial, and we sort of lose a lot of nuance. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where humans getting together and having real conversations about each of our experiences. And when there are disagreements, yeah, when these things get posted online, it oftentimes gets worse. Yeah. Because now you have different sides that are weighing in, and then you have team A and team B. Yeah. And even in the animal rights movement for many years, there was, are you an animal rights person or are you an animal welfare person? These crazy dichotomies. And when people have asked me this in the past, I've said, I'm both. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you have an animal who has their rights at a sanctuary, they also need to have good welfare. Right. So mm-hmm. these things are all connected. Totally. And when we start creating these dichotomies and this, you know, black and white thinking, um, it's, it's, it loses a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, nuance is very important. And that's very hard sometimes through digital media. And, mm-hmm. and, and as a result, I think it's created divisions. I also believe that uh, our opponents, the factory farming industry, uh, benefits from us fighting each other. And I think that that is something also to be mindful of. And we only have so many hours in a day, only so many days on this planet. How do we want to spend it? Mm. Uh, If we're spending it fighting each other, we're not spending it fighting the industry that is our common enemy. Mm -hmm. And so I think that how we spend our time matters. And too often it's spent in unhealthy internal battles. Totally. And it's like we're preaching love and peace. That's our whole thing. And then it's like we're not giving that to each other. So I really do think that we could be so much more effective if we cut the infighting and really just work together. Um, Any last words? I want you to just share how we can help you, support you in the great work Mm -hmm. that you're doing. Well, I think, you know, when we talk about internal movement dynamics or human interactions, there's that saying, hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. You know, so oftentimes some of this sort of unhealthy criticism or unhealthy conduct comes out of somebody who's hurt somehow themselves, right? right? So trying to have empathy for that, not accepting bad behavior, but understanding that oftentimes it comes from a place of pain. Um, And I think in the animal movement, many of us have seen a lot of bad things. And so there is a lot of pain. And I think Mm -hmm. sometimes that plays out in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. So just understanding that Mm -hmm. and trying to have empathy and, and, uh, and patience. And sometimes not saying something is better This is the best approach. Totally. You know, don't feed the ugliness. I think that you bring up a great point that honestly, I think part of the reason that a lot of vegans are able to empathize so deeply with animals is because a lot of us have been hurt or gone through hard times, you know, family relationships, addictions, whatever it is. Um, I know a lot of vegans that have a really wild backstory that now dedicate their work to helping the most vulnerable. Yes. And maybe there's a reason for that. I think there is. I think there is. This ability to feel the pain or to be familiar with the pain, to to, to know through lived experience the pain, you know, causes us, I think, to want to prevent the pain, you know, and so, and the suffering. So I think that, you know, our movement is very kind of 
passionate, very heart forward, heartfelt, mm -hmm. sometimes hurt. And I think that that's part of what we're, we're dealing with. Um, but I think for me, it's really about finding common ground. We all share this planet. We all are just doing the best we can. None of us is perfect. Uh, and when we support each other, we're all better. You know, helping somebody else is one of the best things you can do for yourself. The happiest people are the ones who uplift the lives of others. Quote Sharon Gannon, Jiva Mukti Yoga. <laughs> Love you. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> She's a good friend too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and it, it is very true. So just maybe share some exciting things that you're working on and how people can get involved. Well, you know, at Farm Sanctuary, we're encouraging people to get involved in the political process, uh, contact their elected officials, go to our website, farmsanctuary.org for information about that. Great. Follow us online, you know, our social media at Farm Sanctuary. I also have some on for Jean Bauer. Mm -hmm. um, but also be active in your community. Yeah. Um, show up. Uh, engage with those around you. Uh, it's hard sometimes to change laws in Washington. We will all continue working on that, but it's easier to change things at the local level. So be very active at the local level. Uh, share what you know uh, and share great vegan food. That's one of the best pieces yeah. of advice, I think. It's, it's very uh, immediate. Uh, and when somebody, it's very generous to bring vegan food to an event, to a potluck or a church event or whatever it might be. And when somebody eats vegan food, and hopefully it tastes good, they eat the vegan food, they've actually now incorporated that into their body. So symbolically, there's this acceptance. Yeah. Because so often people, I couldn't eat vegan food. Well, you just did. And you've, you also, it. you've been eating it your whole life, okay? <laughs> like if you've ever had an apple or an orange or a peanut butter or jelly sandwich, you've been eating vegan food. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so true, so true. Yes. So dispelling some of those myths and fears yes. that way. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, guys, if you find yourself in LA or upstate New York, you can go visit Farm Animal Sanctuary. I was there a few years ago in LA and just to meet these incredible residents that have their own stories. It's very healing. I think actually for activists too, to go and spend time with happy animals. I think sanctuaries are healing places. Absolutely. For yeah. non-human animals and also for humans and for activists. It's such a great way to be re-energized, reconnected to what's important yeah. and, and enabled, I think, to do the work longer and better. Amazing. Well, guys, definitely go follow Farm Sanctuary. Go follow Jean Bauer. I'm at It's Jamie's Corner. And thank you so much for spending the hour with us and listening to all these great, this great advice. It really is such an honor to meet you and have you here. Love meeting you too. And we're in this together. Yep. We'll keep doing it. We'll keep doing it. Yep. Until every cage is empty. All right, guys. Until next time. Bye.